Two years ago, I set a challenge for myself. For every character on the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate roster, I wanted to make sure I had beaten a game that they had featured in. Being a fan of Nintendo my whole life, I had a pretty good start on this. But still, there was a surprising amount of series and characters I knew next to nothing about. This is my second progress update, so if you want to catch up on the full journey up until this point, the first two parts can be found in this playlist on my channel. Part 1 explains the whole reasoning of why I'm doing Doing this in the first place, how many games I needed to play, how long it was going to take me, etc. Now, about two years later, as of January 2023, here are my current stats. I completed 8 more games that qualify for this challenge, so now I have 25 games remaining. I started with 627 hours of total playtime left, and now that's down to 407 hours, which is less than I have in Animal Crossing, so the end really is in sight. Also in my two previous episodes, I included how much money I'd have to spend on games to complete this, but I'm gonna take that out moving forward, because who really cares? So now that the explanations are over, let's start talking about the games. First are a couple games I actually revisited this year, but I want to talk about them anyways, starting with Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. I played Xenoblade back on the Wii, and then later on the 3DS, but never got the Switch's Definitive Edition back in 2020. That means that, until now, I had missed out on the newly added epilogue, Future Connected. Xenoblade Chronicles 3's announcement early last year sent me into a full-blown series revisit, so it ended up being the perfect time to find get my hands on Definitive Edition and Future Connected. All it takes is one look at the redone artwork, especially the character models, to see that DE is a huge visual upgrade. While there are some small quality of life features added to this version which elevate it over the Wii original, it's still much more of a visual upgrade than anything else. Definitive Edition is mostly the original Xenoblade experience, but more beginner friendly and includes more flexible difficulty settings, allowing players to make the game much harder or much easier if desired. Even still, I kept things on normal settings during this playthrough and loved it just the same. This world's stunning environments now look better than ever. The redone music is great and the cutscenes hit different now too. Now that Definitive Edition exists, I see no real reason to play Xenoblade 1 anywhere else. In the brand new epilogue, Future Connected was really cute. Not to mention pretty darn exciting to finally play through during the lead up to Xenoblade 3. Straight off of Xenoblade 1, I dove right back into Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I'm just gonna say it, this is one of my favorite games of all time. I still don't really know how to explain it, but 2 hits all the right notes for me. I love this whole series, but there's just something about Gorma, Uriah, Tiger Tiger, Jin, Malos, Nia, Tora, Poppy, Pyra, Mithra, Gramps, and everyone who I'm not gonna mention. This is my favorite group of characters in an RPG game, and it's not even close. But as much as I love the game, this year was actually my first time fully completing it in Torna, a DLC side game that works as an expansion of the main story. So even though I was pretty familiar with Xenoblade 2 already, the gotcha style blade system made it so this new file I created was a lot different from the first. In this game, different files are seeded so that certain rare blades are more likely to pull. So it really is a thrill popping core crystals at the start of a new file to see what you're in for. This is something I had no idea about when I first played, but now I think it's so cool. For this video, I'll keep the Xenoblade 2 stuff short, because this is a game I'd like to write at length about someday. So I'll leave it at this. If you're watching and want to get into the Xenoblade games, I'd recommend this play order. Play Definitive Edition first and do Future Connected right after. Then play all of 2 and Torn of the Golden Country. Don't even think about touching Xenoblade 3 until those are all done. While it's technically possible to play that one first, I think nobody should due to all the references from the first two games in it. But no matter which one you start with, all of them are fairly complicated RPGs that take a while to learn how to play. Luckily, this year I had the idea to create beginner's guide videos for all three games. They're the guides I wish I had when I played for the first time. So if you're starting up a new file, make sure to check those out. And now with Xenoblade 1 and 2 officially completed, I was able to cross Shulk and Pyra and Mithra off my Smash Bros spreadsheet for good. Kirby and the Forgotten Land I'll be honest, I didn't start out last year as the biggest Kirby fan. 
I respect his games a lot, and have had fun with plenty of them over the years, but for the life of me, I could not remember if ever, at some point in my life, I rolled credits on a Kirby game. If I did, it was Air Ride on GameCube, or Kirby's Adventure when I was really young. But I wanted to make extra sure before I cross Kirby off my list. Luckily, I didn't have to deliberate long, because Kirby in the Forgotten Land, the series' first fully 3D platformer, was released in March last year. This one was so good that as soon as I played the first few levels, it was no longer a question of if I was going to roll credits, it was a question of when. I've talked about the Forgotten Land in both my 100% review and my recent Game of the Year video, so watch those if you want to hear my full thoughts. But making it through the Forgotten Land meant I could officially cross off Kirby, DDD, and Meta Knight all in one fell swoop. Ice Climber Okay, now we're going off the beaten path for this one. The NES Ice Climber game has been on my Ambassador 3DS for years now, which means I've casually popped on Ice Climber a couple times here and there. I've never come close to actually completing it though, until now. Like many NES era games, this one was seriously tough. Even though it only took me about three long play sessions to beat, I can't say I wasn't sweating it. I was locked in trying to get the climbers up each of the increasingly complex mountains. Whether it was trying to maneuver across tiny platforms with the game's interesting jump physics and collision detection, or bobbing and weaving through hordes of snowballs, annoyingly persistent birds, and the occasional polar bear, there were plenty of frustrating moments, but never a dull one. Across all games I played last year, new and old, this was definitely the hardest one. It gave me that unique sense of triumph that you get from conquering one of these tough, unforgiving old school games. Which is one reason why I love having this type of stuff in my gaming diet every year. I look back on my time playing Ice Climber pretty fondly, and I have a discussion video about it that acts as my pseudo review for the game too, so check that out if you'd like. But with 32 mountains conquered, that meant it was time to say goodbye to Nana and Popo from the spreadsheet. Packland. For a while now, I've really wanted to know what this weird Smash Bros stage was all about. You know, the real ugly Microsoft Paint looking one that no one likes randoming to. So even though I'd obviously played arcade Pac-Man before, I chose to complete the NES version of Pac-Land, a 2D platforming game starring Pac-Land himself, as my game for this challenge. This is not a game you hear all that much about, so I didn't have super high hopes coming into it. It's a game I actually bought back in 2021, as a result of this Smash Bros challenge. But I was never able to stick it out to the end. Right away, Pac-Land threw me for a loop. When I started it up for the first time, I tried moving Pac-Man forward with the control pad, but he didn't budge. Instead, I found that in order to move Pac-Man forward, I had to mash the A button. Up on the control pad caused him to jump, and then mashing the B button caused him to move backwards. As someone used to Mario, Kirby, and pretty much every other 2D platformer, this was a pretty jarring concept. Pressing A to move Pac-Man is almost like pushing the gas in a racing game, if you can imagine that. So it did not feel very natural at first. But just like with many other old video games, I really just had to pass that initial learning curve. After a while, I got used to these unique controls, and by the end, I was actually sad the game was over. I wouldn't call Pac-Land a must-play or anything like that, but I'm glad I took the initiative to experience it. There were some incredibly tough levels, and I'd say the game was pretty close to Ice Climber in terms of difficulty. So just like that game, it was very rewarding to finally beat. Pac-Land is one of my biggest surprises of the year because I actually liked it a lot. I might not go as far as to call it a classic, but I'm glad to have another retro game under my belt, making it so I can officially remove Pac-Man from the list and move on to the next game in the challenge. Star Fox 64 3D my Star Fox journey started with Adventures, which I've technically beaten before, but I've decided to leave Star Fox in the list still, cause it doesn't feel right leaving it at that. Adventures really isn't your traditional Star Fox game. It's like playing Kirby Air Ride and saying you've played a Kirby game, or Hyrule Warriors and saying you've played a Zelda game. It's a totally different genre. Also, I still needed to account for the Smash fighter Wolf, who I'm pretty sure never appears in Adventures. So I decided to check off the whole Star Fox team in classic fashion. 
This year, I played Star Fox 64 for the first time. Well, I actually played Star Fox 64 3D to be exact, which I later found to be much improved due to the slick visual upgrade, the 3D effect, and gyro aiming. Gyro is a match made in heaven for a game like Star Fox and made my runs through the game a breeze. I've only done a handful of runs and haven't seen all of the game's content, so I definitely plan on playing more Star Fox in the future, but I think this is a really charming game that's a super quality experience for what it is even though I would say something like Kid Icarus completely outclasses it right now. I'd love to see where this series can go past Zero, and I think Nintendo Switch is a good place to do it. If you're interested in these games, check out this channel from a buddy of mine. He started making Star Fox content that you'll probably like if you want a more in-depth look on these games than what I can provide. But with the Star Fox tangent aside, that takes care of three characters on the spreadsheet. Fox, Falco, and Wolf, giving me another good chunk of progress in the challenge. Fire Emblem Awakening I have this weird habit of playing certain games until the very end with maybe one or two hours to go until credits, and then falling off for years to have never actually beaten it. I own several games where I've done this very thing, and don't ask me why. It's probably just due to me being more easily distracted when I was younger. But anyways, this is what happened to me with Fire Emblem Awakening. I know the game fairly well, basically the whole story, but had never technically rolled credits. This year, I finally changed that. My old Awakening file was long lost, so I couldn't just boot it up and finish the last mission. But honestly, this was a good thing. This is a modern Fire Emblem game. These games are literally built to be played over and over again, so playing through Awakening one more time to reach the finish was no chore at all. I personally think this is one of the best and most important Nintendo games of all time, with it having innovative and extremely addictive gameplay systems, some really poignant story moments, and not to mention how it essentially saved the series from the brink of extinction, which is probably a topic for a completely different video. This is one of the games I enjoyed playing the most this year, and it's an experience I look back on fondly. It was the game I was using to fill time in those seemingly never-ending weeks leading up to Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, so for that reason, I'm already oddly nostalgic for it. Playing Awakening for the second time around, I was surprised that it actually felt very fresh. It's been quite a few years since I first played it, and I prioritized different units, making this romp through Awakening vastly different from last time around. I didn't use Frederick to completely wall up the early game, I created different relationships, and ended up with different children. It was great. It was like a whole new game. Except I did use Krom too much, making him way too strong. Something that I guess will never change. But speaking of Krom, finally rolling credits on Fire Emblem Awakening made it so I could cross him, Lucina, and Robin off the checklist for another three character sweep. Bayonetta. And finally, the last Smash character I was able to complete a game from in 2022 was Bayonetta. Ever since her improbable Smash reveal during the DLC cycle for Wii U and 3DS, Bayonetta has been a series I've been aware of, otherwise completely ignored. It just didn't seem like my thing. An M-rated hardcore action game starring a witch that was famous for being a broken character in Smash 4? I thought it was pretty much set in stone that I was never gonna play it. But her presence in Smash Bros always kept me a bit curious. Each time I would choose her in Smash or end up fighting on the Umbra Clock Tower stage, I would ponder what the Bayonetta games were and why they were represented here in the first place. Then there's the fact that these games were being funded and published by Nintendo. For that reason alone, there had to be something to them. Some reason why the greatest video game company on earth was so involved with them. This curiosity was always there, and not long after I saw the Bayonetta 3 trailer in last year's Nintendo Direct, the gloves were off. I was gonna commit. I bought all the games and the rest was history. Bayonetta for me is a perfect example of a time where you really think you aren't gonna like something but end up absolutely loving it. It was a never judge a book by its cover type situation. I put in the dirty work learning Bayonetta 1. I experimented with weapons, items, and combos, learned how to dodge and effectively trigger witch time. It was an at times punishing and maddening experience, but I got through it and it's a game I'll honestly never forget. It's pretty brutal, probably the most difficult and least forgiving of the series, but that's what I like about it. Some of the later John fights had me literally pausing the game in between action sequences because my hands were too tired to keep on mashing. It's cliche to say, but it was a complete thrill ride. Bayonetta looks fantastic too, especially for being a nearly 15 year old game, and it runs smooth as butter on Switch. 
it has one of the best combat systems and series of bosses in video games, and I'm kicking myself for having waited so long to get into the series. Once I finished, I went right into Bayonetta 2 and liked it quite a bit also, but I have to say I was kinda disappointed. I liked the more brutal nature of Bayonetta 1. After really getting the hang of things in the first game, Bayonetta 2 struck me as a little bit of a letdown in terms of difficulty. I definitely could have upped the settings to make things better for myself, but even still, I probably consider it the weakest in the series. Maybe things will change when I eventually revisit it, but for now I consider it a pretty breezy ride that I didn't get nearly as much out of compared to the first game. Having now officially caught up on the Bayonetta series, I can remove Bayonetta from the Smash Brothers spreadsheet as my final completed character of the year. So that's that. 25 games to go, so there's still plenty of fun to be had. Thanks for watching this update for another year, and speaking of fun, I'm gonna leave you all with a little treat. A live look at the random roll of the next game I'll be playing for the challenge. Well, I guess it's time to play Fire Emblem 7.